The Strait of Hormuz is one of the most strategically important straits in the world. It separates the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea, and at points is only 30 miles wide. The strait is bordered by Iran to the north and Oman to the south. Every day over a dozen tankers carrying nearly 20 million barrels of oil are transported through the strait. This represents conflict in the strait was Operation Praying Mantis. During the Iran-Iraq War, Iran placed several naval mines in the strait in order to cut off oil shipments from Iraq. In 1988, and if so, how would the world respond? I have always found this theater interesting due to the confined battlefield space, the limited force the US would have available at any given time, and the importance the area plays in transporting a large portion of the world's oil supply. Ever since Operation Praying Mantis, the Iranian military has focused its development of a force with the ability to take control of the strait. They know that they cannot possibly match the firepower of the US Navy. So over the past few decades, they have turned to asymmetrical warfare. Iran actually has two separate navies, the Army Navy and the Revolutionary Guards Navy. Between the two, Iran operates nearly 2,000 boats, most of these are smaller vessels, which would be used in swarm attacks against larger U.S. naval ships. Although the boats are very lightly armed, the plan is to simply overwhelm the enemy with sheer numbers. In terms of larger ships, Iran operates seven frigates and three corvettes, each armed with four to eight anti-ship missiles. They have about three dozen missile boats armed with a few Russian and Chinese-made anti-ship missiles. The Navy also operates about 30 submarines, two-thirds of which are midget submarines. Probably the most capable of their submarine force is the three Russian Kilo-class subs. The Kilos are quicker, quieter, and more heavily armed than the others. They also operate several mine-laying craft. These craft are typically stationed near the strait and could be deployed to mine the area very quickly. The Iranian coastline near the strait is littered with anti-ship missile batteries, AAA and surface-to-air missile sites, and naval ports and air bases. Most of these are located around Bandar Abbas, Bandar Lege, and Kishem Island, with other sites spread across various small islands and on the eastern edge of the strait near Sayurk. As for Iran's air force, the majority of their aircraft are older. It consists of some 25 operational F-14s, 60 F-4 Phantoms, and 60 F-5s all left over from before the revolution, some 25 MiG-29s, a few dozen Mirage F-1s, and 20 Chinese F-7s, which is a copy of the MiG-21. Iran recently purchased at least four S-300 surface-to-air missile batteries from Russia. This greatly upgrades their air defense capabilities. At least one of these is operational near the strait, and being that they are mobile, it can be expected that Iran might move another to the area, effectively covering the entire region. Iran has also designed their own version of the S-300, called the Bavar 373. It still remains to be seen how effective the system is. Iran states that it is much better than the S-300 but Iran has a history of making highly questionable claims. They also have a number of older SAMs in the region like the HQ-2, China's version of the SA-2, one SA-5, a few SA-6, and at least one US Hawk battery. And finally, one of the biggest threats to the US naval vessels and tankers is Iran's extensive land-based anti-ship missile batteries. Iran operates around two dozen Chinese-made C-801s, C-802s, and HY-4 batteries in the region. As for the U.S., given that this imagined scenario is of Iran closing the Strait of Hormuz unexpectedly, the U.S. would only have whatever assets are in the region at that time. The U.S. Libyus Ready Group in the region as well. Currently, the USS Bataan is on station in the region. It is assumed that there are two to three submarines and possibly one converted Ohio-class sub armed with over 150 Tomahawk cruise missiles within strike range. As for air bases, the U.S. currently has aircraft at Issa Air Base in Bahrain, El Udid Air Base in Qatar, El Dafra and Al Midhad in the UAE, Camp Lemonier in Djibouti, and Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. Aircraft operate at these bases include a wide variety of F-15s, F-A-18s, F-16s, AWACS, tankers, reconnaissance aircraft and drones, B-52 bombers, and has recently hosted B-1 and B-2 bombers and F-22 stealth fighters. If Iran closed the strait, the main objective of the U.S. would be to open it and ensure the safety of ships passing through. The Iranian army today poses a much larger and more advanced threat than it did during Operation Praying Mantis 30 years ago. At that time, Iran was involved in a war with Iraq, and much of its forces were engaged in that war. 
In this scenario, this wouldn't be the case, making the mission much more difficult for the US. To reopen the strait, the US would have to clear any mines and eliminate Iranian naval vessels and anti-ship missile batteries threatening shipping. Clearing minefields requires vulnerable, slow-moving ships and helicopters. These units would be highly exposed to Iranian surface-to-air missiles, interceptor aircraft, and anti-ship missiles, so these threats would have to be addressed first. Despite being half a world away, the US still operates a larger number and more advanced aircraft in the region. The US would need to degrade Iran's air power through dogfights and cruise missile strikes on airbases. But this is also complicated by Iran's surface-to-air missile network armed with systems like the S-300. The good news for the US is that they have extensive experience with the S-300. The US operates at least one S-300 that it uses for training purposes out in the Nevada desert, which the US has taken apart and studied thoroughly. They also train regularly against Greek-operated S-300s. It is highly likely that by now the US has come up with an effective countermeasure against the system, but as with all countermeasures, they do not work 100% of the time. If the US can significantly eliminate Iran's air force and surface-to-air missile threat, the mission would then focus on destroying Iran's naval fleet and anti-ship missile batteries. This would also prove to be a difficult task, as they are numerous, small, and can be easily hidden. The US would also have to conduct large-scale ASW or anti-submarine warfare missions to deal with the Iranian submarine threat. This again would prove difficult due to their relatively large submarine fleet, and missing even one sub could result in heavy losses. And then finally after this, the US could begin the mine hunting operations. Much of this scenario would rely on the location of the US carrier strike group. If it was in the Persian Gulf during the closure of the strait, the US could potentially face several major losses, potentially even losing the carrier at the hands of dozens of Iranian anti-ship missiles, swarms of fast attack craft, and its large submarine fleet. However, if the carrier was out in the Gulf of Oman, or in the northern Indian Ocean, the US could keep its distance, minimizing its risk while it strikes at Iranian targets. Overall, reopening the Strait of Hormuz would be a very difficult task and could take several days. Perhaps a more effective way of ending an Iranian-enforced closure of the strait would be a wider strike on Iran, hitting military headquarters and command and control sites across the country in hopes of degrading Iran's overall defenses and bring them to the negotiating table. This, however, would threaten to escalate into a much larger war, with Iran possibly firing ballistic missile strikes not only at US assets, but also at other regional allies like Israel, and possibly eliciting sympathy for Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia and Iraq. The closure of the strait would not be tolerated by these countries, and their combined force would eventually end any Iranian occupation of the strait.